<laughs> ah, there we go. So, hey folks, um, thank you for coming today. Um, thanks for watching the talk. I've come all the way down from uh, grimy Manchester to uh, be here today. Uh, Saddleworth in particular, which is uh, a beautiful part of the country, most famous because it's where Myra Hindley buried the bodies of their victims. But, um, so, I'm here today to talk to you about design tools inside the browser. Um, when I first started writing this talk, I thought, I've never seen Nyancat in a talk before. That'd be a really cool theme for a talk. And after a couple of beers, I just lost interest in that. And then I got the bring it on, bring on the design tools, bring it on kind of thing in my head. So I decided then that I was going to start doing lots of action hero Chuck Norris type shit for a talk theme. But then after a couple more beers, I got bored of that as well. So there is no theme for this talk, so apologies about that. Hopefully it will be useful to you. Uh, a little bit about me before we start. Um, yeah, I've been at Mozilla for five years. I now manage and am content lead for the writers that write all of the content for MDN WebDocs. So we have a few full-time people and also a lot of awesome contractors like Ruth being way too busy to uh, do the stuff she enjoys because she's writing algorithms for me all the time. Uh, I'm a total open web evangelist, complete hippie guy. I love tinkering around with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. A lot of my job used to involve reading specs and kind of figuring out how the hell they work and what the use cases are, writing demos and tutorials so that you folks can learn how that stuff works without going through the same pain. Uh, now that I'm manager, it's basically getting complained at and filling in spreadsheets, but you know, it's okay. Um, I am a total accessibility whinge bag as well. I believe that even with all of the really cool, sexy new shit that we have on the web platform these days, the universal uh, access aspect is probably still the sexiest thing about the web, so don't forget that. Uh, and outside work, I am a heavy metal drummer, so if you come and talk to me afterwards, uh, please speak slowly. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to start this talk by uh, looking into a little bit of the history of debugging. Uh, in browsers and how we kind of got to where we are now. Um, not quite that far back, but um, my wife has said recently that Aidan Turner is the man she wishes she'd married, so... Um, anyway, enough about that. Um, debugging was really hard in the early days of the web. I don't know if... Uh, who here was building websites like before year 2000? Show of hands. Yep, quite a lot of us. The old school folk, and we can remember back when there wasn't really much in the way of uh, development, developer tools in browsers. We tended to do things like viewing source, although that didn't really teach you how stuff worked, so there was a lot of copying and pasting going on. Um, we, have, we had what I like to call the 5,000 alerts method, um, which I kind of still use sometimes because, you know, you've got a simple piece of code, it's easier just to bung an alert in your JavaScript rather than setting up breakpoints and all of that crazy voodoo nonsense. Um, there were older tools like Venkman. I don't know if anybody remembers Venkman. That was like an old JS debugger, debugger Firefox extension way back when. Um, did a bunch of stuff. But then after a while, of course, this little fella came along, um, Firebug. And it was absolutely awesome because, you know, it really kind of paved the way for what modern browser developer tools look like now. You know, you went beyond simple JS debugging to stuff like DOM inspection and CSS inspection and all of these nice things that we use these days. It had a whole lot of community power as well, which is really cool. You know, there was a whole team of volunteers coding the thing and also localizing it into all sorts of different languages. Um, and it had a lot of users right up to the end. You know, it's like um, in all of the kind of product shutdowns I've seen at Mozilla, this was one of the most sad and heartfelt ones, you know, because there was a lot of vitriol and a lot of, uh, a lot of really heartrending moments talking to all these people that loved uh, Firebug right up to the end, and of course, you know, we changed the entire extensions model, so it died because it will no longer work. But you know, this is the way of the web. Um, but yeah, native browser dev tools have become really slick and awesome. So you know, we're doing well going forward. So I keep saying developer tools, but what about design tools? You know, what about tools specifically aimed at people who do design stuff, like picking colors and looking at UI layouts and sort of you know more visual kind of interests? Because you know. Design on the web has got really exciting again. We have rounded corners, <laughs> drop shadows, and I also saw that animated GIFs have become really popular again. Ah. Um, 
I'm joking, of course. OK, let's try that again. Design on the web has become really exciting again because of things like Grid and Flexbox for uh, layouts. Uh, CSS shapes for much more interesting floating stuff that, you know, you don't just have to float things around rectangles anymore. That's really great. And uh, variable fonts have just come into browsers recently as well, and that's really, really cool. Um, but awesome features need awesome tools. Um, you know, a lot of DevTools features traditionally have focused on the more kind of debugging JavaScript and network requests and all the tinkery type stuff. But, you know, designers don't want to just throw a bunch of commands into a console to get the results. They want tools that are a bit more comfortable and familiar and um, you know, give them freedom to tinker around with tools, to tweak their layouts and things and get exactly what they want and save it back out again. Um, I thought I'd say a little bit about this. Who remembers what this tool's called? Anybody? Yeah, Leah Veroux's tool. It's called Dablet. Yeah. So this is something that the incredible Leo Veru wrote in about 2010, 2011. And this is the first time that we really saw kind of this, a glimpse into this kind of expressiveness that we now see in quite a lot of uh, browser developer tools or design tools, should I say. So if we just run that video again, you know, it's a kind of a code playground thing, but you've got these little pop-up boxes that say, you know, expressively, here's the result of what this uh, property value will actually give you. So, you know, this was really cool and innovative. And, in fact, some of the code straight out of Leah Veroux's tools has been used in the Firefox design tools that I'm about to show you, because you know, it's been very innovative and game-changing. So I've waffled on for maybe eight to 10 minutes so far, but you still haven't seen any design tools. So let's bring it on. Um, oh, yeah. I thought I'd mention a little bit of nomenclature first. Um, so at Firefox in particular, we've uh, We've started to break our tools down to three main types. So highlighters, you know, like things that highlight something that show you where it is, like the DOM highlighter. Inspectors, things that allow you to inspect exactly what's going on. So things like the grid inspector. And then you've also got editors. So things like the fonts editor, things that allow you to actually change code and get an immediate result in the browser. So let's have a little look at the grid inspector. So I'm about to do a bunch of live demos, which I know it's going to go up in flames, but we'll try it anyway. Um, let's have a little bit of a look at that. I've also got a really crap resolution now I'm presenting, so... Hmm. Um, and I've stolen a bunch of demos straight off Jen Simmons' site, which is great, because she's much better at writing this stuff than I am. There. We'll get this demo, so if we right-click on this, I know this was mentioned before, earlier on, but this is really, really useful, because you've got something with a grid on it, and I'll just zoom that in a little bit so it's a bit easier to see. So the main element is set as the grid container, so it's got a little grid label in the dev tools. Click on that, and it gives you the grid inspector, which shows you exactly where all of the different areas of the grid are, all of the different tracks and such like. But if you go into the layout panel, you'll see that you get this nice set of controls for doing things like displaying area names and line numbers and things, if that's useful to you. Um, but you've also got this instant little visual readout here which, as you go across, it highlights all of the different parts of the grid to show you exactly where they are. And not only that, it gives you a tooltip to show you how big that grid is and what the area name is, what the row and column number is at the time. So that's pretty useful. We've also added um, RTL support for grids. So if we were to say, do direction RTL on here. Oh, I've put direction. That's not going to work, is it? Sounds like some sort of Viagra-related project. Um, Direction RTL. So there we go. So that turns it to an RTL layout. But you'll see now that if we go across from left to right on the actual grid thing, it's going from right to left on the actual layout. So it's quite useful to have that available if you work with such layouts. Ooh, that's tiny now. Um, so moving swiftly on, I also wanted to say a little bit about the animation inspector. So. CSS animations and web animations API stuff and transitions, these things are getting increasingly more complicated. So let's just look at what tools we've got to help with these. So I've got a bunch of bizarre variable font animation stuff in here. And if we inspect these, we will see that you've got an animation tab in the CSS rules view. 
And this gives you things like, so you probably can't read this too well, but we're saying here that we've got P with a class of animation property, which is where the animation is actually happening on, and it says the animation is called weight. And down here we can see we've got a weight CSS animation, and it says that this is animating font weight with a linear easing function, and it gives you all the information. So it gives you a similar thing for transitions, but the bottom one is animated using the Web Animations API, and you'll see here it's got those things listed in green, basically to differentiate and tell you it's a scripted animation. And what's even more interesting about this is if we go back to the animation property animation, it says here, so we've got a little swatch here next to our animation property, and if we click that, we've got a nice little um, animation timing function inspector that we can apply different animation timing functions and see the result live in the browser. And we can even drag these handles to alter the cubic Bezier curve, which is generating the timing function, and then we can see the code updating live in our CSS rules inspector. Now, to mention Leah Veru again, she had an awesome website called cubicbezier.com. I don't know if anybody saw that, but that was really cool and basically did the same sort of thing as this, and that actually uses code. This actually uses code taken from cubicbezier.com, I assume with Leah's permission. Um, who knows? Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the font editor. Now, this is one of the uh, more exciting things for me. Like, I absolutely love variable fonts. I think they're a brilliant technology, the idea being that you can basically have one font file that will contain all of your font variations rather than having to download, say, your normal, your bold, your italic, your bold italic variants for doing different parts of your typography. Um, and variable fonts include set lots of different characteristics that vary on things called axes, and they allow you to basically specify ranges of values for things like weight and um, the angle of slant when you're doing an oblique, uh, oblique font form and things like that. So if we have another little look at a different demo. Uh, no, that's not the one. OK. So I'll just show you how this works. If we inspect this element, this is the paragraph that's got my variable font on it. So we click on the Fonts tab, and it gives us the name of the font. There's a bit at the bottom which tells us all the fonts on the page, along with things like the URL to the font file and the full font face at rule, so that you can see exactly what the code is looking like that brought that onto the page. But the most interesting part is this. So you'll see that you've got a slider for every single one of the different axes available in the variable fonts. So for example, you can alter the font weight. And because of the way that variable fonts work, you've no longer got, got just like the multiples of 100 and keywords thing for your font weight. You can actually give it really granular values. But the way that the variable fonts specification stuff in CSS fonts level four works is that there's certain registered axes that are recommended that um, font designers should include. So things like slant, which means basically oblique, and font weight and such like. But you, the font designer can also include basically any custom axes that they want. So they can basically include absolutely anything. So if we look down here a bit, you'll see that in this font, we can vary things like the ascender height and the descender height and the serif height and all of these different kinds of things. So yeah, you can build in anything you want. So it's useful to use this tool if you've maybe, you know, got a copy of this font file that you want to use on your website from some reputable BitTorrent somewhere and you haven't got instructions for it. You can just load it up in here and see exactly the different axes that are available in the variable font. So moving swiftly on with my very eloquent product pitch, um, we have a shape path editor. Um, so CSS shapes, as you saw before, is a really interesting new spec that allows you to specify the shape of images. So you don't and any other element on the page. In fact, so you don't just have to um, have things floating around rectangles. And so we've got simpler examples like this. This is, again, stolen from Jen Simmons' site. I'm sure she won't mind. Um, and so we're using the shape outside property on this image and setting a circle to make it into a circle so that the orange, you can actually have the text just floating straight around the circular shape. But if you click the little shape icon there next to the shape outside property, you can get this up, and you can just do things like vary the actual 
radius of the circle and the position of the circle. And then if we go too large, you can see that that's the actual outer limits of the actual image file itself, which is as far as you can go, which makes sense. But if you come across more complex examples, for example, this one, we've got a grape shape. And obviously, you can't achieve this as a circle, so we're using the uh, path function to do this. And this is basically works just like you'd expect from like, sorry, polygon function, I meant. And it's basically just like an SVG path type thing. And if you activate the shape editor here, you get a point for each point around the path, and you can move all of these to change the position of your path. And you can even do things like add new points to the path by double-clicking along one of the lines, or you can delete them by double-clicking the points. So again, this is really rather useful for playing with this stuff. What else have we got? And how much time have we got? Ooh, 10 minutes worth. So the filter editor is what I'll talk about next. Filters are a really quite cool part of CSS now, you know, coming into line with a lot of the more advanced graphical effects that people wanted. If we load up our filter example, this is a picture of my two daughters in their characteristically very serious kind of pose. Um, but if we inspect this element, oops, we'll see that we've got a grayscale filter set on this image. If we click this icon here, this brings up the filters editor and this has got a number of interesting features. So when you click and drag along the word of the filter, you can vary the values in real time just to get exactly the kind of look and feel you want. You can also add filters. So for example, hue rotate is probably one of my favorite ones. Let's put the grayscale down to zero because with grayscale 100, hue rotate will not work. If we add that, you'll see that again, we can start messing about with the different parts of the filter and we can get a much more interesting look for my daughter's skin, which is pretty much how I imagine them to look anyway. So that's, uh, they are basically aliens. I don't really understand them anymore. Um, so moving on, um, a very quick mention of three pane mode. You might have noticed that in these demos, we've had the CSS rules view and a separate pane to everything else. That's a recent addition to Firefox. You know, usually it's a separate tab under the uh, CSS panel, but We've got this option now to put it out to its own separate, uh, separate pane, which is really useful and opens up all sorts of new interactions. You know, so, if, for example, if you're using the font editor to mess about and edit your code, you can actually see the live update, but you can also see the code update at the same time. So that's really quite useful. Accessibility Inspector is the next one that I wanted to come on to. So this is a new tool, new as of Firefox 61, I believe which allows you to inspect all of the information that is being exposed via the accessibility API in your sites. So if we just take this beautiful example I've got here, which has got great fonts because I have no internet. Um, so if we right click on this, we'll inspect this element, go to the accessibility panel. And to start off with, it doesn't do anything because you've got to turn it on. The reason you've got to explicitly turn on the accessibility inspector is because it needs all of the accessibility machinery in the browser to start up to actually expose all of the accessibility APIs information that the screen reader will um, access and use in the case of people that use screen readers. But that's quite a big performance here if you've got that turned on all the time. So that's why it's turned off by default. So you'll see here that this basically gives you the accessibility tree of the page, and you've got all of these different um, accessibility API nodes, accessibility tree nodes, should I say, in a hierarchy. And then if you click on each of these ones, you can basically get all of this information about each node on there. You know, what the actual DOM node that represents that is, what the area role is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's particularly useful for doing things like this. Where is it? My bad accessibility example. So here, you know, it's easy to, oh yeah, once you've got the accessibility inspector turned on as well, you've got a new right click menu option, inspect accessibility properties, which takes you straight to the accessibility inspector. And you'll see here that when we select our graphic, it tells us that we've got no alt text, for example. 
And when we right click on these buttons, which are helpfully labeled fake buttons, as you're guessing, these aren't buttons, these are actually divs. But I think using divs for buttons is really cool, so, you know. Um, <laughs> So a few future things that we've got coming um, in the similar way to the CSS Grid Inspector, we've also got a Flexbox Inspector coming in the next couple of versions of Firefox. Uh, we've already got a Flexbox Highlighter available, but the full-on ins Inspector will give you more of a Grid Inspector-like experience with Flexbox. Um, we've got a bunch of interesting mobile debugging stuff coming up as well, so better remote debugging. We're also looking at not just having the stuff useful inside the browser, but also allowing it to be integrated into workflows. You know, for example, if you're using VS Code, soon you'll be able to actually have Firefox do remote debugging on things for you from inside VS Code, so that's pretty cool. Um, and we've got an all-new responsive design mode with emulation for things like different throttling speed emulation and different device pixel ratio emulation, so that's pretty useful. But I could prattle on about other different tools forever and ever and ever, because there's so many of them. If you look at all of the other browsers as well, there's a lot of great tools coming in. I mean, I hardly ever use Safari. It's pretty much just a browser I occasionally just check a page in. Um, but whilst I was researching this talk, I had a look at the Safari dev tools, and there's some amazing features in there. My favorite one was the, uh, they have a really, really slick gradient editor in there now, so go and check that out if you, uh, if you have the time. Um, and then there's some great drop shadow editors in Chrome as well, particularly close to my heart because drop shadows are awesome and you should use them for everything all the time. Um, so I'll just take a pause there for a second because that was a big, a great big rant about DevTools. Um, I just wanted to go through one more section. So the idea of coping with loss. Um, and I don't mean, I, I'm kind of talking about loss of a loved one. I'm, I'm basically talking about loss of code. So one thing that is nice about DevTools is, you know, it's a great educational tool. You can sort of just start messing about with the code live and saying, teaching people about how certain properties work, for example. It's also great, as I've been saying, just to go through and, you know, I've got this layout and this setup, which is sort of what I want, but not exactly what I want. So I'm just going to go into the DevTools and tinker about with it until I get exactly what I want. But of course, all that hard work can be lost if you accidentally refresh the browser or completely if the browser crashes or something. So there are tools to help with this. Um, so Chrome has already got a tool called Local Overrides. Has anybody played with Local Overrides here? Yep, quite a few of you. So um, this is a fantastic idea. It's the idea that, you know, if you've got a website, you can basically specify a folder to save local overrides in. And local overrides are literally things like CSS files that when you enable local overrides and then start to make changes to your CSS file, it will save a copy of that inside the local overrides folder so that when you've got local overrides turned on and you refresh the browser or restart it, it will then bring your changes back via this uh, local CSS file. So that's really, really useful. And then we've also got uh, a tool coming up in Firefox called Track Changes, which is going to be basically like a scrobble bar of the history of the stuff you've done inside DevTools, so you can return to any moment on it. We haven't got that anywhere near working properly yet, but it's coming. Um, and that will allow you to persist things after refresh and restart as well. So I think this is kind of a very useful kind of interaction because, you know, count the number of times that I've lost useful code work because I've accidentally refreshed my DevTools or whatever. I'm sure most of you have the same kind of story. OK, so that pretty much brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to Jen Simmons for all the amazing demos. She is awesome. And also Martin and Razvan on the Firefox DevTools team for reviews and inspiration for this talk. So thank you very much, folks. <laughs>